Um, you talked about the Steve Harvey book. Yeah. Um, Act like a lady, think like a man. Yes. Uh, which went on and it broke records. It was the best-selling book of 2009, according to Nielsen. With that book, right, because it was so big, because it moved so fast, mm -hmm. did that change anything for you as an author? It opened so many doors for me. Like, I ended up doing Jesse Norman and Taraji Henson, all of them referencing Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. Hey, what's going on, family? Welcome to another episode of the Traffic Sales and Profit Show. I'm your host, Lamar Tyler, and I'm excited, right? Make sure you tune in and lock into this, because I got one of my old school friends coming in today, Deneen Milner, who is your favorite author's favorite author, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She wrote half the books on your bookshelf. She wrote them, and you ain't even going to realize it until you go look after this. What's up, Deneen? Hey, Lamar. Thank you for having me. I'm no, so excited for you, excited to be here. Thank you for saying yes. Right, like th this is this is awesome. I, you know, I don't say no to you and Ronnie. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to have a conversation um, about books. I'm sure it's a lot of authors writing sure. or listening, rather, right? And I also, um, I know for a lot of authors, like that goal is New York Times bestseller. You know, they they say like, hey, like, what's the goal with the book? I want to be a New York Times bestseller. So I said, I need somebody to come on this, reach that status. How many times now? Six. Six times. Yes. Right. Six times New York Times bestseller. Yes. Um, to talk about what that looks like. Does it even feel like what they think it feels like? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we cut the chase of that. Um, how do they get, like, like what are the, like, what's the machine look like to actually get there? I'm curious about that. Um, and even if we talk about the six ways, like, you know, was it different ways that each one of those pieces got there? But before we do that, I kind of want to talk about your backstory a little bit because your backstory is just amazing too. Okay. okay. So, so before you became, um, Denise Milner, the go-to um, for books, for your own books, for you know uh, uh, books that have been licensed for films and movies, um, for celebrities to say, hey, that's why I want to pen my book. How did you get started? Did you always know you wanted to be a writer? No, I actually wanted to be an architect mm. and an interior designer, and still have that in me. Like you know, just love interior design in particular, architecture. But um, my physics grade sucked. I, I'm terrible at math. <laughs> I am terrible at math. And my dad, because we didn't know any better, said you have to be good at physics and math in order to make a building stand. And so, you mm -hmm. know, like, what would you like to do with your life if you can't be an architect? And um, at the time that he asked me that question, and I was 14 years old in the ninth grade. So, you know, my dad <laughs> asked me, like, what you going to do with the rest of your life? And I'm, I'm like, I'm 14. Because I'll I'm be 14. asking my daughter, ask my 14 year old. I'll like, be like, hey, look, Thomas, come on, girl, what you doing? I don't think it's too early. <laughs> you know, like, I, I really don't. Like, my, my younger daughter told me at age six that she wanted to be a doctor. Wow. And so everything that I did, from that moment on was geared toward, well, how do we, you know, like appease this curiosity? What is it that she she would need to do to, you know, solidify that that's what she wants to do? And she's, she just started med school. She's 23 and started med school over the summer. And so, you know, I, I truly believe that kids need to be focused. They don't have to do the specific thing that they said they wanted to do at six or 14. I didn't end up doing the specific thing that I chose that day, mm -hmm. but I was in sort of that, that, that path. And that's what my dad did. He was like, okay, well, if you want to be, I thought I wanted to be a television journalist like Sue Simmons because Sue Simmons was interviewing New Edition and I love Ralph Transman. I was supposed <laughs> to marry him. Hey, Ralph. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that didn't happen. But, uh, you know, my dad was like, hey, tomorrow go back to school and see what you have to do to become Sue Simmons, this legendary broadcaster. I go back to my school and it turns out that they had a radio station that was student run. If you came with your records, you could have a you could have a show. Wow. Um, they had a television station that if you agreed to stay for an additional class after school was over, it was like eight periods. And if you stayed for a ninth period, you could be a part of this class, learn how to use camera equipment, editing wow. equipment. Um, we filmed the plays, the football games, basketball games, you know, PTA meetings, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then uh, I joined the yearbook and 
just wrote stories for the yearbook. And I was able to use all of that to get a scholarship um, from my local newspaper, Long Island Newsday, went to college, thought I was going to do broadcasting, fell in love with writing. And that's how I became a writer. Um, Newsday gave me an internship during the summers to get more black folks. I didn't know at the time that it was affirmative action, but it mm. was like a court ordered program um, geared toward getting more black people into the news business. And so during the summers, I had a job and learned how to write and be a journalist uh, working for Newsday during the summers. And then the final summer, I skipped the internship with Newsday and went to the Associated Press and became a writer for the Associated Press and then made it into the political bureau with the Associated Press, caught the attention of New York, uh, the New York Daily News, went to be a political reporter for them, covering Dinkins and then Giuliani, um, Mario Cuomo, and then uh, left politics to write entertainment because didn't like seeing that sausage being made under Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> um, who, you know, like, it's so funny to see the position that he's in now because he was yeah. such a terror for New Yorkers when I was covering him. Um, wow. And so now here he is, you know, sweating. A terror for all of us. Right, right, so <laughs> by everybody, right? Sweating. Y'all, like, we've been on this. <laughs> right, we, we, right. we could have told he you back in the 90s. We tried to tell y'all, y'all didn't listen. We didn't, we tried to tell you, you didn't listen. Exactly. Hey, if you're listening, I want you to think about this. Our community needs you. So if I need you to grow your business, it's only one way for you to do it and make it happen, and that is with TSP Propel. TSP Propel is like Netflix for black entrepreneurs. It's a go at your own pace, self-study system of over 50 plus courses. In addition, we give you resources and templates to execute faster, and we're gonna do monthly calls with my coaches to make sure you get everything you need and get your questions answered. For more information, visit www.tspropel.com. So, um became started writing entertainment um carved a niche out for myself specifically covering black folks in entertainment because mm -hmm. nobody was doing it um so you know nobody would be covering Halle Berry or Denzel Washington or Love and Basketball or mm -hmm. Terry McMillan and sort of her whirlwind tour not just in books but in movies and I did that got a lot of attention for it um, and ultimately ended up getting book deals based off of some of my stories um, and then went and became a, a magazine editor. Uh, but if I could say for a minute, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important for people, especially younger people, to realize that there were not as many outlets for no. black story, even black celebrity. That's right. Because you would think like, well, well, you know, you're a black celebrity. You can get anywhere. Right. But right. it's not really like really for the last decade where it's been prolific that Without you got all question. these outlets, which are basically outlets that um, people like us started, right? Right. Doing, doing That's that, right. Doing the blog That's exactly here, really. it. That's exactly but before it. before that, it was not. Because I remember uh, when I worked at a at, uh, television station in D.C., mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my homegirls, shout out to Micheline. Micheline, like, worked in the newsroom, and she would always have to specify and fight for black guests to get on. Yep. And this ain't like the eighties, yep. right? Even yep. I'm, talking, I'm talking about this, this is, is like the 90s. 2005, this is 2000s, right? Two thousand six. I'm talking about her when Eric Benet came to town. Her having to go in and fight that Eric Benet should be a guest on the show. And the only reason they even took him was that they, she explained, "Oh, this is Holly Berry's ex husband." Then it's like, and oh, then okay. it's like, oh, okay, right. yeah, like her having to fight that somebody's book who you wrote, Charlie Wilson. Yep, she had to fight for Charlie Wilson to be a guest. Which is crazy. I believe it. Because on the, and this would it. just frustrate us as 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 black employees because the same show that I knew that she had to fight to get Charlie Wilson on, like that morning in the news, they would have like lawnmower races. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, right, 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 right. I'm like we, we're fighting for this. Listen, now? like I we're would, fighting like like Charlie, Charlie me, Wilson is a black institution. Is, is is the man the Gap Band and Charlie Wilson and his catalog <laughs> of music is unquestioned. But here we are questioning whether or not he's newsworthy. Yeah. I, I quit my job at the Daily News after a conversation with this. They had brought in this young white guy who, you know, was probably like 15 years my junior. And he comes in and I had written a story on Jay-Z, mm. a profile on Jay-Z. And Jay-Z said to me something that he 
pretty much says in all of his interviews, but that when he would get stressed out or need some quiet time, he would get in his old Lexus that he had from when he was a drug dealer and drive around Brooklyn listening to Donny Hathaway's A Song For You. Mm. So I'm like, I love you, man. Because Donny Hathaway, A Song <laughs> right. For You is like, that is, is that's yeah, the right. song that's going to, to completely chill you out, right? And this white editor comes in and I'm already side-eyeing him because I'm like, you're 15 and, you know, you're 15 years younger than me. You're about to be my boss. I've been here for eight years, writing circles around y'all, writing books in the middle of the night, raising two right. kids. And, you know, I'm on MSNBC and VH1 and MTV talking about my work. And you're going to, he calls me over to his desk and sets a chair next to him to tell me that my, you know, with my story all redlined. Mm. Like I didn't know how to write. Like I was too. Like I was some high school intern who was being taught how to write stories. And so I sit down next to him, you know, attitudinal. And he says, like this line, you know, nobody really knows who Donny Hathaway is. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> what did you just say? And he's like, nobody knows who Donny Hathaway is, so this line doesn't really need to be in here. It's nice that he gets in his car and drives around Brooklyn, but you don't need to say listening to a song for you because the readers won't know what that is. That's the whole thing. <laughs> right around but, his car. But don't dig matter. it. Thank like, you. But dig it. <laughs> right. Exactly. But what was crazy was that the Daily News was the sixth largest newspaper in the country, and about 75 to 80 percent of the readers knew exactly who the hell yeah. Donny Hathaway was, right? And so here was this guy who, just because he didn't know, he didn't know who Donny exactly. Hathaway was, didn't matter to the 80 percent of the readers who would know exactly who yeah. that is, would completely get a kick out of the idea that this rapper exactly. chills out to Donny Hathaway as specifically a song for you. And it's a, a, a beautiful detail. Yeah. And so I was like, how do you not know who Donny Hathaway is? Donny Hathaway is the reason Stevie Wonder exists. Mm. And he's like, I don't... Nah, 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 nah. And so you don't... I mean, Jimmy Buffett is a good you know, example of a... And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and so I quit within like the next two weeks because I was not going to be sitting at somebody's side, you know, having them disrespect me, my culture, music yeah. and the job like this was the job right and the readers too exactly that, that means, like you really don't know who the customer is exactly precisely which, which above all and all things like even if you don't connect if you don't know like you, the number one question you then, must do, know. Do, the, do the client do the customer know thank you who this is that we're talking must about know, That's all that which was my you know argument yeah. meant nothing i was nobody i was the yeah. you know like the you know, 800-year-old intern who needed to be told how to write a story. So I got the hell out of there wow. real fast. <laughs> so as you leave, you already had started um, publishing books before yeah. you transitioned all the way out yeah. of being a journalist, yeah. right? Um, at, at what point did you know or did you say, okay, like writing books full-time is, is going to be my thing? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was it the passion of it. Was it, okay, now I'm making enough money? Because mm -hmm. maybe I had the passion before, but the yeah. checks ain't add right. up. Like, right. like at what point was... Right. That transition. I was writing books um, with a full time job just because we were living in New York and it was super yeah. expensive. We decided to move to my ex husband and I decided to move to Georgia when um, I got a, a, a decent book deal, um, but I was getting sick. I was stressed out all the time. I could not handle all of the different jobs I was doing. I was writing books. I was working a full-time job. I guess when I left at the time, I was working for Parenting Magazine. I was an editor there. And I was freelancing for like Vibe and Essence and Ebony and all those yeah. stuff. So I had like three full-time for real, for real jobs going at the same time while I was raising two little babies. And to me, um, you know, being the best mother that I could be was the most important thing. And I couldn't do that and and deal with the the illness that I was getting from being stressed. Wow. It was all stress related. And so um, it was like, you know, we can build a life for these girls and I could be there the way that I want to be there for them as a mother if we move to somewhere where it's less expensive, we can get some land, they could play in the backyard. I can meet them at the bus stop in the morning and in the afternoon and still do my work during the course of the day. And so lucky me, parenting had just um, decided to go in a different direction with a, with a, a column that I was the editor of mm. when I worked there. 
they said, oh, well, she doesn't want to do this anymore. And we have this opening. Do you want to write this column? And so I left New York with a book deal, this column that was making me about the same amount of money as I got working full time for the magazine. And then I still had all of my contacts for, you know, the freelancing. So when we first moved here, I had, you know, know, it, it was fine. And I just kept building on that and building on that and building on that. And ironically, moving to Atlanta or the Atlanta area, I lived out in Snellville, Georgia. But moving to the Atlanta area opened up the the um, the book deal for Steve Harvey, who was looking for an Atlanta-based writer. And then I wrote a children's book series, like a teen series with my friend Mitzi Miller that they wanted set in Atlanta. And they only wanted an Atlanta writer. So I like when I got here, um, within like three months, I had four books, four book deals. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so um, and shout out to Danina right, publicly. Danina's the one who helped us find our neighborhood, our, our first neighborhood when we, when we uh, got to uh, the Atlanta area. I remember we rode around all day with our realtor. I uh, was frustrated, like, we don't know if this is going to work. And then he was like, you want where? You ain't go to the right side, right? Follow me. It's like, like what time y'all leaving town? We literally about to right. get back in town, get in, our, right. get in the car and go back to Maryland. Right. said, give me a few minutes. Follow me, right? And we like drove around her, uh-huh. minutes, found yeah. a perfect neighborhood. Yeah. So she helped usher us yes. into the Atlanta area yes. with the rest of the history. <laughs> um, all right. So, so once you make the transition, right? So you're in Georgia now. You got some, some deals and different projects mm-hmm. moving. Um, you talked about the Steve Harvey book. Yeah. Um, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. Yes. Uh, which went on, and it broke records. It was the best-selling book of 2009, according to Nielsen. Yeah. And how many weeks was it on the New York Times bestseller? Do you remember? Ooh, I think like 63. I'm like, did it leave, right? Yeah, right. It was like 63, 63 um, At the time, yeah. well, let me, I got a few questions around it. At the time, was that your first celebrity book that you had written? I had written... I think I had written a Nene Leakes book before then. Had I written Nene Leakes? Yes, I had written Nene Leakes's memoir. Okay. And I had written two children's books, one that was a ghost-written situation, so I can't even say her name. Okay. But the other one was with Holly Robinson Pete, um, okay. a children's book called My Brother Charlie, about her her son who is autistic. Okay. Yeah. All right. And and I love because because I'll tell you, I probably told you past, but what's crazy is that... Um, I'm trying to remember how we connect. I think I saw one of your My Brown Baby from your website, mybrownbaby.com. Make sure y'all mm-hmm. check it out uh, from the website. And I was like, ooh, this would like be a good fit for Black American Kids or something. Yeah. I reached out. So I know we had started talking. Yeah. And we've been in communication and started to build a friendship. But I remember I was talking to my friend Micheline, who I, who I mentioned before, and she had to act like a uh, lady think like a man book mm-hmm. on her desk. Mm-hmm. And I was just talking to her, picking it up. And I was, you know, playing with it while I was talking to her, and I turned to the spine. And it's like one of the movie moments, <laughs> like when, <laughs> when like everything come together. And I'm like, Denise, oh crap, that's the name I've been talking to, right? And, di- and didn't realize it. Yeah, yeah. Um, with that book, right, because it was so big, because it moved so fast, mm-hmm. did that change anything for you as an author? Did that give oh, you... Oh, my goodness. It's like that kind of opened up the floodgates oh, for things. Goodness. Like, how, how did things yes, change for that? it did. Like, I mean, at that point in your life, like, how exciting was it? Exciting? Right. Was it stressful? Like, what was that like? It was, it was exciting. Um... It was, it opened so many doors for me. Like people look at Steve Harvey and they see all the things that happened to him Mm. after the book came out, which, you know, he rightfully deserved every single thing that he got. And people kind of look at me and they're like, oh, she didn't get anything. Like nothing (laughs) happened. Like Steve Harvey got, you know, his television shows and his radio station show and, you know, movies and all that. And I'm like, no, trust me, honey. I I came up off of that book. Um, You know, I did the second book, the second book uh, based off of that. And then Steve Harvey talked to his friends about, oh, you're looking for a writer? Mm. Like, Charlie Wilson came through Steve Harvey. Wow, I didn't right? know that. This, they're very good friends. And Charlie Wilson was looking for a writer, and Steve Harvey suggested me, and we ended up doing our book together. Um, Jesse, Nor- I ended up doing Jesse Norman and Taraji Henson, all of them referencing Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that opened the door for me doing all of these celebrity memoirs and people recognizing my writing because I wrote for so many other people. I was still doing a lot of freelance. My Brown Baby opened a bunch of different doors. And so I had like 
all of these different personas, right? It was like Deneen, yeah. the author, Deneen, the blogger, Deneen, the writer who does like, you know, writes for the New York Times yeah. or whatever. Um, you know, what I find is interesting is that when you have different personas like that, for one, you have different buckets of people mm -hmm. based on mm -hmm. each one. Yep. And yep. Um, how people, what I find is like how people come into your world is kind of how they know you. Right. And right. how they interact with right. you, right? It's right. Like, right. So, uh, yeah, right. It's, so it's there's like, there's a bunch of bloggers who don't know that I <laughs> write, you know, <laughs> Like, oh, you bloggers with us, girl. Right. You with us. And it's like, like, come on, get in this car with us and go to this place. And I'll be, you know, yeah. and that's, that's who I am. I'm, I would never try to think, writing books for celebrities is, is I always say, is a, a test of the checking of ego, right? Mm. Because it's not my book that right. I'm I'm putting out into the world, right? It's a book that I wrote for someone else. So I, I'm more like a doula, helping them give birth to their own story, but it's not my book. And so, you know, I don't get to walk around here with a big head talking <laughs> about, you know, like, look at my book as a New York Times bestseller. It's it's a new it's yeah. my book and I do get to take that um, that credit as a New York Times bestselling author, but they are, that's Taraji's book, that's Cookie Johnson's book, that's, you know, Steve Harvey's books. They're not mine necessarily. Yeah. And so, um, you know, when I go and I'm standing in front of a bunch of bloggers, it's like, oh, that's Denise, she writes My Brown Baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that her book was a, a movie yeah. last week. And what's interesting is to them, My Brown Baby could be a big accomplishment Right. Than the books. We're probably, right. probably in another lane. That's it. In the traditional publishing world, they're probably like, oh, that little website you got to keep. That's it. That's right? it. Right. So it's, it's That's it. All of my, so all of my pieces. journalism friends, right? <laughs> so like we put the, the books aside and we, you know, put the blog aside. The, my journalism friends are like, you writing a blog? <laughs> huh? Like, do you get paid for that? Well, let me tell you I got paid <laughs> from, you know, doing the blog. The blog solidified me as a national parenting expert yeah, that's good. and in a way that opened the door for me to have my own television show, that opened the door for me to have my own podcast, that opened the door for me to be on the Today Show telling folks how to raise their kids and writing columns for Yahoo. And so, you know, all of these different facets of my um, my own personality really came out in all of these different ways that I do my career and created this legacy that I'm really proud of. If I didn't write another word, if I walked out of here and didn't write another word, I, I've done my job. You definitely have. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, I, wa I want to shift gears and talk about writing a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for you, right, because you've written so much, front pages of uh, the trifecta, right? Mm -hmm. Ebony, Essence, and Jack. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> right. some, other, some other, you know, publication probably right. got more right. circulation right. than my favorite. Right. Uh, <laughs> right, that's right, that's right. In TSB land, in my favorite, right? Um, but you've done those, you've done the books, you've done New York Times bestseller. What's been your favorite projects? Oh, goodness. I, so right, you know, right now I'm doing, um, uh, I run an imprint, a children's yes. book imprint at Simon & Schuster. And that has been probably the most rewarding out of all mm, of the things that I've really. done. Just because my goal when I started it, I started it originally with a small publishing company out of Chicago called Agate Publishing. Um, and we did some phenomenal work with this small little fledgling publisher that had never published children's books. We just had the same idea at the same time. He's like, you have my brown baby and this, you know, wrapped audience of black parents looking for black books and you write and you write children's books. Would you be willing to do this? And I had gone to him thinking I can pitch this children's book imprint to him because he had a, he had an imprint that was focused on black books and black authors. Okay. How about we do some children's books? We literally showed up to the table with the same idea. Um, and so we, through that, through that partnership, we, um, we did five books and one of them was Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut, which went on to win every major award wow. that there was to win for children's books in the year that it came out in 2017. It, the awards were in 2018, but it came out yeah. in 2017. And um, and that caught the attention of Simon and Schuster. Um, that and a piece that I'd written for the New York Times that um, was titled uh, "Black Children Don't Read a Want to Read About Harriet Tubman All the Time." Mm, ain't that true? 
And that was my my goal with Denise Milner Books. It's just like, we don't need to write about slavery. We don't need to write about the civil rights movement. We don't need to read about, you know, Black First. All of those are worthy stories. But what, what about the stories about kids catching the school bus for the first time and the jitters that they have for attending first grade? What about the kids losing their first tooth and waiting for the tooth fairy? Yeah. Black children have all of those experiences. Where I come to age stories. Right, that ain't exactly. Set against the backdrop of uh, the race riots. Right, exactly, <laughs> of police yeah. brutality and this, that, yeah. and the other. And so, um, you know, I said I wanted to create a, an imprint that's a love letter to black children and families mm -hmm. that speaks to our everyday experiences. And Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut was exactly that. It was a story about a little black boy going into the, the barbershop and getting his hair cut and how special he feels when all the people around him are are completely focused on making this a good experience, teaching him the camaraderie, the love, the community that you feel when you go to get your hair cut. Um, and that caught the attention of Simon & Schuster. Simon & Schuster offered me a deal that would allow me to do even more, um, to put more money in people's pockets, to um, hire the illustrators that I couldn't afford when mm. I was at, the, uh, at Agate. And most importantly, to open the door to stories and to people who didn't necessarily have the keys to yeah. that door in the publishing industry. And so if there's anything that it's most rewarding to me is that I got a, a text message from one of my authors. Her book came out um, right when the pandemic started. Like I started with Simon Schuster in 2020, the first book came out in mm. April of 2020. Wow. Um, and she sent me a text message last week. She's like, how in the world did this book make royalties? <laughs> 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 Who bought this book? And I'm like, you know, we're, we're rolling with a company that knows how to sell books yeah. that, you know, is not going to stop selling the books. There are some companies right. that, you know, like after six weeks, they don't think about it anymore. This company really does kind of dig its tentacles into different um, places that weren't necessarily um, available or known about when I was with the smaller publishing company. Yeah. And that, you know, is what gives these books longevity, longevity. But what I love is that these books are award winners. These books are beautiful. I give stacks regularly to people who have mm. kids. I have, uh, I think, all together there are 16 that have come out. I have awesome. another one coming out next month and then a few more coming out next year. And I get to usher those into the world. And if there's anything I like to do is to create those opportunities. I love it. Now, let, let's talk about those opportunities because you've been now in a position where you've been the writer. And now you, uh, through your imprint, right, are helping other writers kind of yeah. get to the masses and sell books yeah. along the way. Yeah. Um, for people to say, all right, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to go the traditional route to get published. So I want to get published by Simon & Schuster right. or imprint. Right. Like, what should they be looking to do? Like, like, how can I take my, my book or my idea for a book and actually get a traditional publishing house to be interested? Sure. Well, most traditional publishing houses require you to have an agent, right? And so you would have to find an agent who deals in children's books, who may have an interest in the kinds of book that you want to write, um, and who has the, um, the tentacles, again, within the industry to go to the right publishers and the right editors at those publishing houses to be able to sell your book. I um, know how hard it is to get an agent to sign on to your work, mm. and so I don't require you to have an agent. So anybody could send a, you know, a manuscript to me and it will be taken and looked at seriously and considered to be published. Um, once you get an agent, that agent will be the one to show the work to, you know, a bunch of editors or have one or two specific editors that they want to that they want to show it to. And from there, if you get a book deal, it's off to the races. Um, you know, but it doesn't stop at the writing. Once you, you know, have the story, we're responsible, your publisher is responsible for finding the illustrator. Um, we're responsible for doing the sales and marketing, the publicity. Um, and it can be a process that can go anywhere from a year to four years, depending on what, depending on when that book will 
uh, be published. So right now, I'm taking books right now that won't be published until 2025. Now, I'm guessing that most people probably don't realize is that type of time. Like, yeah. they come in, like, I got my book. Right. Like, six months from now. Right, <laughs> right, New York right. Times bestseller, right? But they don't, wow, that's it does time not, span. It does not work that way. And mainly because we have to get our ducks in a row in terms of the sales force. There's like, yeah. you know, sales force, you have to win the sales force over within the company because they're the ones who are gonna go out and make the deals with the Targets and the Walmarts and the, yeah. Yeah. you know, Books of Millions and and uh, the distributors and the libraries and the, the organization, the book selling organizations, the Northwest, the Southwest, the East Coast and the West Coast. All of that sales force covers all of that. So it's not just you popping your book on Amazon and hoping somebody will find it. It is literally like going out there and becoming a, a part of the fabric of the actual community that sells books and reads books and hands those books to children. And that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to get the illustrator and then to have the illustrator do the sketches and then the actual artwork. I happen to be a stickler for having illustrators who um, do what we call reflective art, which means it's not digital. They are literally painting wow. all of the, the work. That takes time. They can't just whip that up in a weekend, right? Uh, and then there's you know understanding how that, how that book will flow and how the story is being told. There's so many different things that go into making a quality, beautiful book that is going to stand the test of time. And that takes time. It takes time. Wow. Hey, I'm, I'm curious. This is the way my marketing mind works. What happens with those original pieces? Because I'm saying you take the original pieces and you get them digitized for the book. Right. But what happens with those? With the those artist pieces? keeps them. Wow. And the artist can do whatever they please with them. So usually there is a um, an agreement between the illustrator and the author. The author owns the rights to the character, but the illustrator owns the right to the work that was created mm -hmm. with that character. And so they have to decide if they're going to do, you know, like if they're going to try and take this to Disney and get a movie. Yeah. Or Because they both would have to sign off. Absolutely. Like interesting, absolutely. Interesting. Um, but the the author has the right to take that original work and um, make photocopies or calendars, whatever they want to, and sell it as artistic work, yeah. but not as a story featuring the character. Now, let me ask you this, because this is this is what I've heard over the years, but you'd be a great person to say yay or debunk it. What I've heard is that over the years, um, the publishing houses do not market books like they used to. No, they don't. And so, like, as an author, right, where a lot of people think, like, hey, I've made it if they're releasing my book. It's still a lot of re responsibility on you to actually get out there and move and market whole and sell it. A whole lot of responsibility that you have to take on. The amount of work that the the book company has is insurmountable. Like I, you know, like there are some days where I like my eyes are <laughs> you have really a new respect. buckled. You, you, have a new, you have a new respect. <laughs> absolutely, you the other side absolutely. Of the table. Eyes buckled. And if you keep, and I, you know, like I have my imprint. I'm the only editor in my imprint. And, you know, like I have access to the publicity team, I have access to the marketing team, but they don't work only for me. They work for, I think there's maybe like eight or nine imprints within mm. um, the Simon & Schuster books for uh, children and young readers. Um, and, you know, and, you know, they're huge. It's just me. Yeah. And then there are, you know, all these other ones. And, you know, if you're not willing to sell your own book, if you're not willing to do what it takes to sell that book and get out there and let people know that it's coming, it's going to get lost in, in yeah. the sauce. It really and will. And it's interesting to me. I think what most people think is, hey, I'm going with a big company so I don't have to do all that mm -hmm. stuff, not realizing That's, that they will. It's, it's the exact opposite, actually. When you talk to authors, I know you you always speak and on panels and things like that. Um is there like a certain lens where you say like, hey, if you're looking for this or trying to do this, then traditional publisher may be for you. Mm -hmm. Like, are, is there anything that you look at like that where you say like, hey, you're better qualified for a digital publisher if you check these boxes? I mean, for me, I'm just looking for a beautiful story. You know, I don't know. I, there, you know, there are people who look for track record. There are people who look for, you know audience, audience you know, built-in audience yeah. size, you know, like how many people follow you on Twitter, how many people follow you on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. And that 
is meaningful. But to me, if the story is not there, then none of that other stuff matters, yes, yeah. right? Like this is something that's going to have your name on it into perpetuity. And we want it to last because it's a beautiful book. And so when I'm, uh, you know, finding books that, that speak to the everyday experience of Black children, I'm looking for books like Crown that, you know, like you can open up and every Black man and boy and teen that I've shown that book literally giggles when they read it. They giggle because it makes them feel like what it feels like to be in a chair with surrounded by a bunch of other Black men. And, you know, there's a line in there that I actually had to fight the publisher on at the time. It said... It wasn't Donny Hathaway line. No, it's the Donnie Hathaway line. It's another Donnie Hathaway line. We love Donnie. No, it was, there's a line that says, you feel like you're surrounded by a thousand black angels. And he was like, well, why does it have to be black angels? And I was like, well, here we go. why doesn't it, why can't it be black angels? Right. And he's like, but it's not necessary. They're just angels. And I was like, yeah, to you, they're just angels. But you know, you know what it means in, the, in Christmas time when you go to the store and you're trying to get angels to go on your mantle right. and, and you can't find any that look like you? Like it means something to say black angels. And every time someone gets to that line, a black person gets to that line, they they they're like, yeah, man, this is this is for us. And so I'm looking for those books that speak directly to the heart, that grab you from your heart and make you that remind you of what it means to be loved and nurtured and be in community and be one with your people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're just not going to, that's not going to, it's not going to last if you don't, to me, if you yeah. don't have that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, like I said, we, we mentioned earlier that you've now written six New York Times bestsellers. Yeah. For those books, what was the machine like around them? What, what Was it pretty much Ooh. known before the book even hit that, hey, like the whole company is moving to like, this will be a New York Times bestseller, all eyes on it, all salespeople on it. That's pretty much how it works. And you know, like it, when, when you spend a certain amount of money to purchase a book at a, pu at a book publishing company, you are making the commitment to make that a bookseller, because a bestseller, because wow. you have to make your money back, right? That makes so, sense. So if, if, I paid $15,000 for Deneen's, you know, autobiography. That's going to be a very modest book. We might print like 10,000 copies. If we sell 5,000, you know, it's cool. If we don't, oh well. But if Taraji Henson comes along and you give her millions of dollars for that book, you got to make that money back. And it's Taraji Henson. Taraji Henson is going to have the platform to go out there that Deneen Milner does not yeah. to sell that book. She's going to be on, you know, morning television shows. She's going to be on late night television. She's going to um, be in all the places that are going to get millions and millions of people to know that she has this product coming out and you can buy it. Um, she's going to get special attention from book clubs. She's going to get mm -hmm. special attention from Amazon. She's going to get special attention from Barnes and Noble and Walmart and all of, and Costco and all these other places because she's Taraji Henson, right? Same thing with Steve Harvey. Same thing with Charlie Wilson and Jesse Norman because they're celebrities. And so if you pay that kind of money for a book, and I'm not just saying that's just for celebrities. If there's a book that people, you know, editors recognize is going to be a hit, like it has all of the 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 ingredients for it to be something that everybody is going to be like, oh my God, that is the best book ever. Oprah is going to want want to make this one of her, um, you know, like her books, which is still the key to best to becoming a bestseller. Really? Is Oprah is still, even without the show, if Oprah wow. says yes. It's on. Really, your becoming a bestseller is about how much we paid for that that book, mm -hmm. which will trigger the publicity, the marketing machine, and all of the things that are necessary to make sure that, that book sells. A first and foremost, because we're trying to make our money back, but B because we know when we paid that money that we have a potential hit on our hands because of who you are or because of what the story is. And so um, you know, I, I think that it's kind of rare for you to be able to, you know, just have kind of a sleeper hit. There needs to be the machine behind it. The machine behind yeah. it. How many copies is it you need to sell in that first week, roughly? Oh, my gosh. I couldn't even tell you. And I don't think that that 
It doesn't matter. It fluctuates a little yeah, bit. It okay. fluctuates, but it's, it's it, like that doesn't, I've had books that have sold a specific number in the first couple of weeks and you would think that it should be on a New York Times bestsellers list. But if it's not in specific reporting mm. um, stores, there are right. specific New York Times bestsellers reporting stores. So if I sold, you know, a thousand copies in, um, you know, in a, in a local bookstore that is not a New York Times bestselling reporting store, then it's almost like it didn't happen. And, and you know, that goes back to something I always talk about. You have to know, starting out, what you want the end result to be. Right. And like what the goal is. Right. right? I think like too many people just fumble right. through business. Right. Right. Whether it's writing, authors. Right. And, and actually, right. I'll say like specifically with authors all the time. Right. Because I meet authors all the time that are trying to do things with their books. And I'm like, well, what's the end goal? Right. Because I, I had somebody tell me, well, my end goal is, you know, I want to get this book in the hand of 10,000 young girls. I said, well, you want to get in the hand of 10,000 young girls, let's set up a funnel <laughs> where you can do a free plus shipping offer <laughs> right. and get it in their hand. Right, right? Right, you know, right, that's, that's, right. Like a that's whole, all you're trying to do. If you're trying to sell right. it for 30 bucks a pop, right. it's going right. to be an uphill battle right. if you ain't got the machine behind right. you to sell 10,000 copies, right? Right. right. Um, but then, you know, somebody else is like, hey, I want to make a ton of money. Well, then the strategy is different, right? right? But, but right. even what you're talking about, I love it because, um, you know, like, again, if, if the strategy is I want to sell as many books as possible, being a New York Times bestseller, you could do one right. without doing the other. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. And, and even though, you know, and it could be a staff and it feel good for your ego, it's probably somebody's not on that list that makes a whole lot more money than the person that it is. Precisely. And then I'm, I'm assuming there are costs associated with the machine that runs right. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. And it's like, I, you know, like, yeah, I have six New York Times bestsellers, but that didn't necessarily change things for me. Mm -hmm. Like... Writing a story in the New York Times about the need to to uh, to to create stories for Black children that move away from slavery and civil rights movement did more for my career than any of my six New York Times wow. bestsellers did. Right, so it's it's being intentional and focused and understanding what can come from this move that you're making. And I knew that writing that story was going to get attention for Deneen Milner books. I didn't anticipate that it was going to get the attention of Simon and Schuster and yeah. have Simon and Schuster say, well, "Hey, why don't you come over here and do this with us?" But you know, like that opened the door for me to run this imprint. That's created all of these opportunities for me, not just as an editor but as a writer. And it's you know. You just, you have to be really intentional. I love it. And um, some of the things that you think would, you know, make you, get you to the pinnacle aren't necessarily as useful as some of the things that, you know, are just about putting your nose to the grind and grinding. I love it. Yeah. I got a few quick fire questions for sure. you. Um, if someone is an aspiring author and they're watching this, like, like what advice would you give them to start with? Read. Read and write every single day. There's not a day that I don't sit down. I have a notebook. I have my computer. I have my phone. There's not a day that goes by that I don't write something, not just because I have to, but because, um, you know, for work, but because it's it's a muscle. You don't have a, you know, like th there's not a day that goes by. I believe that Charlie Wilson doesn't sing, right? Mm -hmm. It's his muscle. He has to make sure that his voice is at top tier in order to do what he does. Steve Harvey, there's not a day that goes by that he's not plotting out some kind of business thing because that's how his his machine runs. There's not a day that goes by that, you know, like a, a concert pianist doesn't sit down to the piano and play. They have to. You have to exercise that muscle. So it's writing and it's reading just to see what everybody's doing, what yeah. what's out there. Like I, I have a stack of books next to my bed, a stack of books pretty much in every corner of my house. And at every, you know, if I'm not writing, I'm reading something. Right. Um, so, you know, read and write for sure. All right, and I'm, Ronnie, if you're watching, you heard that. Deneen, Deneen has a stack of books. <laughs> Ronnie, get on me because my stack of books on the night stand. I got a stack of books on the floor. Listen. Did she be like, where are going? Did she put them places? That's why I don't like you move my books. Because then when I need them, right. they're not there, right? I need, I need there, to right? know where they are. Exactly. I need, so, I need to know where I am. I appreciate right. that. That co-sign. Um, for you, right? How many books totally have you written now? 31 published. 31 published. And then I have one children's, two children's books coming, one in 23 and one in 24. And then I have a novel that's coming out in 23 that's going to be kind of a big deal. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, out of those, give me your top three. Your top three favorites. I know all out of, of your my, Out of my 31? I know all of your babies. Oh, but goodness. Give me your, your, your out of the ones that are published or unpublished? Published. Let's do published. Oh, published. Ooh, published. Um, okay, so I have a children's book called Early Sunday Morning. Yes. I have that several one, copies of right. the house. That one is Love based it. on the first time I stood up in church and sang. Amazing um, stories and illustrations. The illustra- I like right you. now Vanessa as you're saying Brantley it, Newton. I literally yes. can re- you know, remember the cover right Yes, now. Vanessa Brantley Newton is a goddess and I saved up all of my coins so that I could get her <laughs> to illustrate because the, the publishing company that I was with, Agate, couldn't, you know, wouldn't pay for her services. I had to pay for it myself, mm-hmm. not all of it. So I, I had to, you know, come up with the rest of the money for her fee and she illustrated the mess out of it and it looks just like my mother and just like my dad and just like me and my girls and um and that one makes me happy because it's kind of dedicated to my mom who mm. um you know was very much a church woman she loved her she loved her the lord right <laughs> and um and jog for jesus every sunday and uh and took me and my brother and made sure that we understood um, this moral code that she had. Uh, right. And and being in the church created this kind of community that, um, that, that I really needed growing up, that we really need, we really needed growing up as a black family from the South in the North um, in the 90s in a pretty segregated kind of neighborhood. Um, that church was was a lifeline for us. And okay. so that book very much um, speaks to that community that I remember growing up and that was the foundation for who I am today. Okay. And specifically my mom. Um, then I really liked um, J- the Jesse Norman book because it was like the kind of writing that I hadn't done before just because um, Jessie Norman, she's a world renowned uh, opera singer, if in case folks didn't know, um, black woman from Augusta. She fell in love with operas, listening to the radio uh, and became this this world renowned opera singer. She passed away maybe like three years ago or so. And Jessie was so mean to me. She would there would be times when she would I would literally cry. Wow. Just she would make me cry. And I'm not the biggest crier. And Jesse would make me cry. She would just really come at me really, really out the side of her neck. But the stories that I was able to get from her, because she had traveled all over the world wow. and, the, and done so many things with so many different people. And the stories of it, that I was able to get out of her, the way that she spoke really translated beautifully on the page and just raised the level for the kind of writing that I was able to do. So she pulled something out of me that, you know, I didn't necessarily like, you will not be able to look at act like a lady, think like a man and compare that to, you know, stand up straight and sing. Um, That book, that level of writing was just completely different for me. So even though the experience wasn't the best, that book means something to me. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then I really love writing Taraji's book. Um, Because Taraji was just cool people. I was about to say, I can see the two of y'all like. Oh my God, we had the best time. We'd be on the phone just (laughs) for hours, for hours. And then sometimes, you know, like we'd be on the phone in tears. You know, like she just, she has this this personality that you see is who she is. Um, And she just made it really easy to tell her story and, you know, like just being really vulnerable was something that, you know, like she embraced in that whole process and that whole journey. She she held back nothing and it's on the page and she didn't pull any of it back. And so that was a really great experience. All right. I love it. I love it. Um, this has been amazing, right? Uh, for the people listening in, how can they contact you? How can they find out about the imprint? You know, sure. how can they find out about My Brown Baby? Sure. All, all the things in your universe. I am My Brown Baby everywhere, but I might be changing that. I got to talk to you about that because, you know, the, the blog is still there and it's there for like basically archival purposes. Yeah. I don't really write on it anymore because my kids are grown and they're like, don't <laughs> you be telling all my business. I'm I 23 and you better not. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, like I still have people who are like, you should still write for it. And I'm like, I, I just, you know, like I think I've run out of things to say about when it comes to parenting. And, you know, we, we were, me and Ronnie, we were um, like influenced for Pampers for like 10 years. Mm-hmm. Then one day Pampers was like, look, y'all, 
Like you younger kids. You know them shit that ain't got. Like you know them shit that ain't wearing no damn panties. We see like years worth of uh, 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 wipes and diapers every right, year. We right, just right. donating them out right, to causes right, and these. They like look right, y'all. Uh, right. This been a good run. I think we but. done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I feel about it. Right. And and you know I I just um I'm in the middle of putting together a new website that's going to my mandate for it was to marry all of my different personas like we yeah. talked about in the beginning. Deneen, the author, Deneen, the blogger and parenting expert, Deneen with the TV show and Deneen with the podcast, Deneen, you know, writing these stories for these magazines. Like, how do we marry that so that, um, you know, like you understand that it's not just pieces of Deneen here and there. And, you know, like the bloggers don't know about the perfect thing for you. We're going to talk about Okay, good. I I could could stand (laughs) your your expertise on this. Um, And so she's she's put together this gorgeous website that, you know, kind of puts me all in the same space. And I kind of feel like I need to move away from my brown baby and be Deneen. Um, And so but for now, (laughs) <laughs> I am my brown baby everywhere. And you can, I'm pretty good about answering DMs and, and all of that stuff. So for sure, reach out through there. Or you can go to DeneenMilnerBooks.com and see the books that, I, that I'm that i working on with the imprint and reach out to me there if you want, if you have a story that you want to tell and you want me to consider publishing it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for watching another episode of the Traffic Sales and Profit Show. And if you're an aspiring author, um, get the book done, <laughs> right? right? Like, it's, it's, you know, see, me so many people with books on their hearts, right? That's right. Like, if you don't get it off of your heart and onto That's the pages, right. it does not exist. That's um, right. And listen to all the advice and expertise that Neen gave you today so that you can get started and get moving in the right direction. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Traffic Sales and Profit Show. Hey, do me a favor. If you enjoyed what you heard today, subscribe and follow us on this platform right now to make sure you do not miss a beat as we drop new episodes and additional content every single week. Also, if you'd like to get access to a free paperback copy of my book, access to the TSP Traffic Sales and Profit free Facebook group, our challenges, resources, our events, and more, make sure you visit us at www.trafficsalesandprofit.com forward slash podcast.